Hello and welcome to another edition of the Stench of Truth. I wanted to take an opportunity to go into detail into some of the recent things that not only I have done videos about, but also to give you some background on some of these topics so that you will know where I'm coming from and uh, how I have arrived by the uh, opinions that I have on certain topics. Now, uh, there, of course, in the recent video I was talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the war between Israel and Gaza. And uh, uh, obviously in an effort to uh, express my frustration at yet another war of bloodshed, murder, and death that uh, I was just calling on an end of hostilities and not really pointing out you know, who's to blame and why and uh, what is the you know, results of this conflict and that sort of thing. And uh, of course uh, that issue is much more complex than what uh, is generally regarded by people. Uh, you have to remember that Israel was basically created by the UN. It took land that belonged to other people and that people lived in and um, displaced a lot of people. And of course in their ever quest for more, because there is a hardline faction within uh, Israel which is focused on what is called Greater Israel and you can look that up and you can find out all about it which is a much larger nation state which would require them to actually take over other lands. Now when it comes to the Palestinians they've been basically continuously pushed into smaller and smaller ghettoized areas which uh, are walled in enclosures for the most part and basically open air prisons. Israel has been conducting a blockade against uh, Gaza for years and uh, these people have to do without many of the amenities that other people enjoy and even basic uh, life-sustaining material. So um, there's basically this, this boils down to the fact that uh, both of these entities hold some of the blame for what is happening to them, but by and large most of it falls on the backs of Israel because Israel uh, operates a policy of continuous uh, pressure, bombardment, and uh, an effort to crush the spirit of the Palestinians. This seems to be their, their technique. They continuously apply pressure, uh, periodically bomb, and uh, go to war with uh, in an effort to have the Palestinians just give up on their quest to have their own land. And uh, as I pointed out in the past, of course, uh, the surrounding Arab nations are uh, partly to blame in what is going on there because there are too few of them who will, you know, be aggressively pro-Palestinian and or attempt to do something to resolve the situation in any positive manner. It seems as though the Palestinians are used by both sides of this. They're used by the Israelis as a so-called terrorist boogeyman and they're used by the surrounding Arab nations as a way to slam Israel for their uh, terroristic acts. And let's make no mistake, when, uh, before Israel was established as a nation and afterwards Israel and the Jews, the people of Israel, they conducted terrorist activity both against the British and the Arabs. They had gangs, most notoriously the Irkun. They attempted false flag operations like bombing a ship of Jewish refugees in an effort to blame it on others. They also have attacked uh, the United States directly with provocation, knowing full well via the USS Liberty. So Israel is a uh, nation that is uh, quite capable and used to conducting false flag operations, conducting terrorist acts, and also having a complete disregard for their supposed allies, that being the United States. So uh, this is a nation, and this is a nation that uh, you know certainly does not warrant any trust now. Let me point this out. Is Israel really even a nation? One of the ways that you define a nation 
is by its borders, and Israel refuses to say where its borders are. Therefore, Israel really can't say anybody is attacking them over their borders when they refuse to acknowledge that they have a particular border. And the reason they don't do this is because they view the areas that are held by the Palestinians as part of their nation and even further out to the greater Israel extent, so they do not want to define their borders. So uh, it's quite illogical to say that someone is attacking my nation whenever you will not define your own nation. So they fail once again in that regard. Palestinians. I have a lot of respect for the average Palestinian who is existing and living within this environment where they are refusing to be crushed underneath the constant pressure of the Israelis to get them to just quit. Basically they want them to quit and, and to let the Israelis do whatever they want. Israel is uh, not on their own ever going to accept the two-state solution because then that would require them to define what their state is and where their borders are and give the Palestinians a state themselves. Now you will notice that, the, that what areas the Palestinians occupy are separated. Uh, they don't even get a contiguous uh, portion of the area themselves. And Israel, of course, continues to occupy territory that was gained in illegal wars of aggression that Israel engaged in with their surrounding Arab neighbors. And uh, that doesn't seem to be even an issue anymore. I don't even hear people talking about it very much, about Israel giving back that land as well, which is something that should be done. But of course, they're not going to do that. And they continue to uh, expand their settlements and other things into areas that they should not be doing that into. And this is just a continuous way to whittle away at opposition. So uh, that, that needs to be borne in mind whenever you talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And you need to realize that by and large, um, Israel is the instigator for a lot of this activity because Israel is acting as a terroristic rogue nation. The other thing that is very interesting about this whole thing is, of course, that Israel, you know, it's a known uh, uh, secret that Israel has nuclear weapons. And the fact of the matter is that either directly or indirectly, those nuclear weapons came from the United States. Now, uh, there are several different stories about how this came to be. Supposedly, Kennedy wanted to stop this from happening. Uh, supposedly, this was something done uh, with German and South African help. Uh, and some material was stolen from the United States, and also I'm sure there is a there is a, a certain uh, uh, idea that people have that the United States just gave them nuclear weapons or allowed them to research and develop them uh, clandestinely so that they would have them to represent a bulwark against any kind of aggression against Israel that would overwhelm them. Uh, really, doesn't matter, you know whether or not <clears throat> uh, they were given nuclear weapons or they developed them themselves, they have them. And uh, this is something that is really not uh, factored into anything whenever you discuss uh, any of the conflicts that are happening in the Middle East that involve Israel. And it should be discussed because it is a very important issue. Um, now, another thing that I talk about a lot and that I think needs to be expanded upon, and I see a lot of people who want to try and deny this particular aspect of things, it is, it is a historical fact that the Nazis survived World War II. The German people and the German military surrendered. The Nazis never did. Uh, it is a matter of historical record that Nazis continued to be Nazis after World War II and engaged in a program that was an extension of the Nazi ideology during the time of Adolf Hitler. Now I see people who try to claim that uh, this whole quote unquote Nazi stuff is decades old and doesn't have any relevance today. Well that's a bunch of fucking bullshit, okay? Uh, you're denying historical reality, okay? Um, 
we brought over the entire Nazi Eastern European spy apparatus in total, completely intact, run by its own general, and it continued to be run by its own general, Reinhard Gellin, after World War II. Now, the Soviets picked up a lot of uh, German scientists, a lot of German military people, a lot of German spies as well after World War II. And it is my contention and the contention of many others that the Cold War was completely manufactured by the Nazis. Nazis who were working in the United States and Nazis who were working in the USSR. Many people have looked at the ramping up of weapons and uh, Department of Defense uh, expenditures in the United States based on assessments that were made by Reinhard Gellin and his Nazi apparatus. Now remember, this entire apparatus was taken in total, run in total, by the Nazi general in charge of it under Adolf Hitler, given autonomy and run by itself under the auspices of the CIA during this after-war period. And uh, many of their assessments made it seem that the Soviet Union was way more advanced, had way more nuclear weapons, had way more uh, abilities when it comes to launch vehicles, etc., 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 which precipitated the arms race, which caused the Cold War to escalate. Nazis in both governments, infiltrating both governments, worked each each nation against each other in a Cold War arms race for their own purposes. And I aver that a lot of this was done so that a third force, and that would be Nazis, who had escaped, and there were many that did uh, Germany after World War II and were uh, secreted away to develop technological advancements that they had discovered during their own scientific research during the 30s and 40s. Some of this stuff being the most advanced in uh, other countries, either officially or unofficially, and they developed these technologies while the while they kept the Americans busy with the Soviets and vice versa so that no one would be looking at what they were doing. Now, most of this stuff is historical fact. And to deny that there is no lingering Nazi uh, presence and that the, the quote-unquote Nazi stuff is decades old and holds no value today is just flying in the face of common sense and you just refuse to accept what is boldly put before your fucking face. Okay, so uh, now uh, to give you a concrete example otherwise, uh, uh, apart from the intelligence aspect of this in the Cold War, uh, per se, it, all you have to do is look at NASA. Uh, two of the chief people in NASA were Werner von Braun and General Dornberger, both of which were Nazi uh, scientists. They were in the SS. And these people came over and basically ran and directed our entire fucking space program. We even had a Dr. Struckel, who was a uh, um, high altitude uh, experimenter who conducted experiments on people in camps and uh, did terrible things, who was part of our space medicine program over here. And there are many others that we don't even know the names of, I'm sure, who conducted war crimes and uh, did terrible experiments on people. And of course, after World War II, we had a period where there was experimentation on our own people, both military and civilian populations, by our own government. Uh, I don't think they needed any help from the Nazis, but certainly it didn't hurt to have Nazis in the government who had done these sorts of things before, and it extolled the virtues of the kind of experimentation that they were doing in order to justify their continued existence. or. Uh, you know, our survival against the evil Soviet menace. And uh, that brings me to the next thing, and this is this whole idea of communism and socialism and all this kind of stuff uh, that people kind of trot out as their, you know, demon of choice whenever people talk about stuff that's different from what we're commonly presented in uh, 
politics of today. And the most common thing that you hear from uh, the far right, uh, fascist, the Republicans, is that uh, Obama is some court of, sort of closet Marxist, uh, you know, a socialist or communist. And um, that's just completely absurd. All you have to do is look at everything that he did while he's been in office, and you will see someone who is kowtowing to corporate interests, kowtowing to Wall Street, big money, and the banks. And uh, this, of course, is fascism. It's far right. It's right up their alley. Uh, the only reason this is an issue is because we have this false left-right paradigm in this country that people like to talk about, but then they fall in the trap of doing it themselves. All of these people follow the same exact leaders. They follow the exact same script as far as the end product goes. Okay, they may have slightly different approaches to to reaching that end product, uh, but basically they're all enthralled to corporations, multinationals, uh, international banks, the Federal Reserve, and all the banks that own stock in them, and all the shareholders thereof. So. Um, Obama is a Wall Street puppet. All he's going to do while he's in office is do everything he can to make sure the banks remain, that uh, all of corporate uh, all of corporate America is propped up. If that means uh, them going overseas, giving them bailouts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's going to be nothing done for the people. There's going to be nothing done for families. There's going to be very little done for job creation, for doing anything for the economy that benefits people. Now, in a classic classical socialist model, um, you know, you would have the government running everything and they would dole out to everybody what they needed in order to survive and that would include health care. And that brings us to Obamacare. And Obama, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, uh, trotted out by the right as a giant government takeover of health care, is just ludicrous. Yes, there are a whole bunch of regulations that are involved in Obamacare. Yes, there are certain things that people have to follow. But basically, the, the absolute nugget of Obamacare, the, the central tenet of it is that you have to buy a private health insurance policy from a private health insurance company or pay a fee which has been designated by the Supreme Court as a tax in lieu thereof. That's the fundamental tenet of Obamacare. And basically what this amounts to is the government bailing out the insurance industry, the private health insurance industry, by mandate, telling you that you have to buy their shitty policies to get shitty level of care and shitty level of coverage from these companies in order to prop them up, bail them out, and this is a way of them doing it without them giving them money directly like they did with AIG and the banks and the bailout. Okay, so that's the nugget of this. And if this is not um, more fascistic, whereas you have government corporate cooperation and or ownership one way or the other, okay, that's fascism. There's nothing socialist about it. There's nothing communist about it. You know, the regulations are another thing, okay? Is, is this indicative of some sort of secret communist Marxist takeover plot? No. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. And if someone could point out one, you know, secret Marxist uh, thing that Obama has done, you know, there's always this constant uh, refrain from Alex Jones, this stupid fucking idiot from Texas, about how they're coming for our guns. There's absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. And they want to point to the UN Gun Ban Treaty, which absolutely has nothing to do with anything going on in this country. Manufacturers of guns can continue to sell guns, have been continuing to sell guns, have had unprecedented levels of sales, and uh, have been doing really good business because everybody has bought into this hype of fear that somehow Obama is going to come for your guns. And it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. They have no need to come for your guns. Why would they come for your guns? You know, if the government wanted to crush dissent in this country, they have a myriad of weapons that they can bring against you. If you have a compound somewhere, they can just send a predator drone after you. They don't even have to risk 
a single fucking policeman to take you out. Okay? There's no need for them to come after your fucking guns. So give me a fucking break, Alex Jones and all you other fucking retards. Okay? There's nothing closet Marxist, closet socialist, closet communist about Obama. Though I will say, and I've said this before, that Obama has been absolutely groomed for his position of importance in politics from a very young age. And he has been surrounded by leftists from a very uh, early age because he has been designed for the role that he has. He has been groomed for the role that he has today. And this is why now there is not this huge uproar from what's left of the decimated left in our country against Obama and his grand bargain, which is going to attack Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid because he comes at it from a left perspective he makes it seem like this is something that has to be done whereas if it was attacked by people on the far right you know they would be called cold and uh, you know hate say that they hated uh, you know grandma and that uh, you know all the things that you would normally call them but when it comes to Obama you don't say these things the left doesn't say these things to him remember as soon as he came into office, the anti-war uh, movement in this country was basically destroyed. Um, you know, we had Occupy, but that basically dwindled out to nothing, okay? Because it was infiltrated by several different organizations in an effort to try and uh, take it over and use it for political gains. Now, <coughs> excuse me. There is no real left in this country. Um, if you want to talk about people like Michael Moore, the people who get into the news who represent the, so, the so-called left in this country, these people are absolutely and totally useless. They do nothing, they accomplish nothing, and they have no real program. You know, they talk about a specific issue on a specific day, but they buy into these wedge issue topics just like everybody else does, and they promote them. I do not deny and I will never ever say that abortion and uh, pro-life and issues like this, you know, these very strongly held social issues are not important to individuals and groups and religious organizations and things like this. But when you have a country that is on the verge of economic collapse, you have massive joblessness, you have uh, a health care crisis, you have you know, so many problems in this country of failing infrastructure, uh, uh, jobs being outsourced overseas, um, you name it. There are massive structural problems in this country that threaten the country itself. There are things that the government should be doing that are more important than having uh, these issues be center stage, okay? I would rather tackle the idea of getting, uh, you know, having a jobs program, uh, tackling economic issues, and then you can come down to some of these very solidly held beliefs, you know, as far as pro-life, pro-choice. Um, so I'm not minimizing the importance of these things to individuals, you understand. They are extremely important and very firmly held beliefs and they deserve to be talked about. But when it comes to national stage, they should be secondary. But you see how this promotes this left-right idea, you know. Just look at the look at the election and the run up to the election and see how these wedge issues, these social issues have come to dominate the debate. And I hardly heard anything about uh, jobs about doing something about the economy. Yeah, they talk about deficit reduction. Romney did say he was going to create 12 million jobs, but he didn't say anything about how he was going to do that. Nothing. Not even a peep of a squeal of a tiny little thing uh, did he offer in the way of uh, telling us how he was going to create 12 million jobs. And I don't really recall Obama really talking much about uh, creating jobs, although to say here and there that jobs were necessary. But people were divided uh, quite strenuously on the wedge issues, you know, pro-choice, pro-life, uh, um, and women's reproductive rights, and women in general. 
with the fascist far right wing assholes, you know, making their comments about rape and, and women and etc., which would classify them as being asshole jerks and having, you know, no um, respect for women, you know, making this a, a big issue. And of course, women's equality in the workplace and everywhere else is very important to me. It's an important issue. I think women should have equal pay and all of those things that are important to women's rights uh, activists, okay? But in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to be something that I'm going to be focusing on when you're looking at greater problems. So do you understand what I'm saying? When it comes to communism, you know, and people talking about, oh, the terrible communist, I think communism was made into this horrible menace during the Cold War, but, but mostly by the John Birch Society and the far right wing fascists that currently dominate our entire political spectrum in this country. Because the Soviet Union was never even a communist nation, okay? It never attained communism, okay? Look up the definition, you can see that it never actually was a communist country. It wasn't even a socialist country because it never reached the level where it was uh, actually, it actually fulfilled all of the things that socialism represents never came close to communism. There are some countries in Europe that are referred to as socialists, but they're sort of mixed. All of these economies are mixed to some degree or another, okay? And um, most of them incorporate some forms of capitalism, and some of them are, are quite successful. So these are all bogeymen. And I, I don't really think that a government could ever really be communist fully or socialist fully. Um, probably the best kind of government that you could have would be a combination. Um, I don't know, maybe something like uh, Germany or some of the Scandinavian countries um, would probably be the best form of government where you have actually, you know, a, a very vibrant private sector and you also have the government involved in things that are important for everybody. And because I believe the general welfare clause actually does mean the general welfare, that means that the government has, uh, as part of its responsibility, the general welfare of the population. And that includes health care and a lot of these other things. And as I've pointed out before, I think health care is a basic human right. And the answer to health care is not forcing you to buy a shitty insurance policy from a bankrupt insurance company, okay, for an exorbitant amount of money that doesn't cover everything that you, that you would like it to cover or that it should cover. Uh, that's not the solution to health care. That's why I have said that some of the things that people have pointed out as being problems, both from the fascist far right saying that we need to, you know, attack these programs. Let's look at a couple of things like that and try to um, come up with an answer and a, an answer back to some of these things. First of all, you have Obama, who is the wolf in sheep's clothing, a... Uh, fascist corporate Wall Street monger, okay, with a left cloak on, so the left is left stupefied and dumb and can't even come up with any kind of, uh, you know, real criticism of him or sustained uh, protestation against his continuous assault on themselves. And I think that uh, the black community in this country has been victimized even worse by Obama because he has basically singled them out as people who fail to take responsibility for their lives. The same kind of things you hear from Ayn Rand and the asshole bootstrappers on the fucking right. Like Paul Ryan, Mitt Romney, Ron Paul, all of these fucking assholes. Okay. And Obama has several times singled out the black community for this kind of uh, notion. So if I was in the black community, I would be more offended by Obama than I would be by some 
you know, uh, some of the white presidents that have come before him. Uh, but let's look at this. He can propose his big grand bargain as a way to, you know, address the deficit and debt so-called problem that we have in this country by attacking Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid because the left is stupefied because he's wearing this, you know, sheep's clothing, as it were. And the right, uh, of course, wants to do this, but if they were to actually engage in this activity, there would be massive protests against them because they're supposedly on the right. Now, you need to remember that all these people are in the same exact camp, the same team. There is no left and right. There is no left and right in politics anymore. Everything you have in politics now is all on the right. Everything's to the right. There is no left in politics. There are a couple of, of people who would be on the left who occupy political positions, but I think they're just left there. They're put there so that people on the right can point to them and say, he's a socialist, he's a communist. Uh, you know, while denying their own fascism. So, uh, there is no left anymore. It's dead. There's no left in this country. It's dead. So anybody talk about left, communist, socialism, it's all dead. Um, so let's talk about this deficit, debt, you know, fiscal cliff kind of thing. All right, now, uh, Obama wants to attack these programs because it's part of the program of who he is and why he's in office. He's put there to do that. He's put there to decimate what's left of the social safety net in this country and to throw everybody uh, down into the... Uh, poverty-stricken, homeless, jobless, living on the street, um, and class, and transfer that wealth up. To continue the transfer of wealth up to the to the rich and everybody else. So now, um, everybody tries to say that Social Security, Medicare, and all these other programs are broke, and we can't afford it, and all this other kind of stuff. The first thing I need to to point out to you, which is something that everybody should know, but doesn't is that Social Security and Medicare are off-budget items. They are not included in the budget. They are not part of the budget. Okay, They are only included in the budget by people who want to make an issue out of it, Okay, to try to make it seem like things are worse, so that they can then say, we need to do something about it. But they're not part of the budget. They should never be part of the budget. They should never be included in discussions about the budget. And anybody who talks about unfunded liabilities. Um, basically, this is all having to do with Social Security, Medicare, and all of these other programs that are similar to this, you understand, that are not budgetary items. They are not on the budget. They were removed from the budget because they have their own dedicated revenue streams. Okay. Now, Social Security is not broke. Medicare is not broke. Medicaid is not broke. Okay, uh, things can never really go broke in this country because you have the Federal Reserve, and that's why I've been, that's why I've been saying, and and I want you to think about this really. I I, I want you to think about the, this issue very, very seriously. Okay, there are a couple things uh, that need to be addressed when it comes to this. First of all, Social Security is not broke. Okay, it is one of the most successful government programs of all time. Medicare has been extremely successful. It has an extremely low overhead, approaching 1%. Okay, and no private ins health insurance company can even come close to that. Okay, and as far as how beneficial it has been, you know, any measure, take any measure over the past, you know, 50 years that we've had Medicare, or however long it's been, um, any measure you want to measure it by, it has been a resounding success. Now, I think I read an article in New Economic Perspectives which pointed out that the right, the fascist right, only attack successful government programs because successful government programs go against their basic tenets, which say that the government can't do anything right. They never attack failing government programs. So if you look at the government, you can find a lot of programs that they don't run very well. But they're not Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. They're none, they're none of those. Those are run very well. They have been very successful, and they continue to be successful. There are very basic issues that 
people need to understand. And when the right attacks successful government programs because it puts a lie to the fact that they hold this belief that government can't run anything right, they never attack programs that are failing because it supports their notion that government can't run anything right. So they like those programs to stay there because they can point to them as a reason why the government is a poor runner of things and shouldn't be involved. We could actually have one of the best health care systems overall in this country because we have probably the best health care delivery system in this country uh, with very high-tech uh, approaches and things of this nature uh, to uh, uh, solving health problems. Uh, the problem is between the patient and that health care delivery system. And rather than have a private health insurance company come between those two with its 40% plus overhead, which add hundreds of billions of dollars a year to health insurance costs in this country, get rid of that. And have Medicare for all, for life. You're covered from when you're born to you die. Okay, of course the Medicare program would need to be revamped a little bit in order to cover more conditions and you know take into all these things into account okay it would need some structural change um, and as far as funding goes that could be accomplished by a couple of very simple things tax Wall Street that's number one have a transaction tax have a at least one percent transaction tax so when you have Goldman Sachs conducting um, maybe, who knows, maybe 500,000 transactions a day, maybe millions. I don't even know how many they do, but they do these computerized trades that happen continuously. Maybe they're doing a million trades a day, a billion trades a day. I don't know. But if they make, you know, like a penny off of every transaction because they're playing exchanges against each other on the computers. And of course, you know, there's massive things like this. And you can have a, um... And you can have a, uh, what would you call, an exemption for people under a million dollars. Okay, and that would take care of just about everybody who plays the stock market and, uh, you, know, you know, has their own little stock fund to, for their retirement or whatever. And uh, that would probably exclude just about everybody in the middle class and below. Okay. Uh, but a 1% tax on all transactions uh, on Wall Street and... Um, having a premium that you have to pay that could be, um, if you're working, it could be something that is taken out of your paycheck like Medicare payroll taxes. Now, Social Security similarly could be, uh, the entire funding situation for Social Security could be uh, eliminated by removing the cap, which I think is $106,000 right now. You remove the cap on earnings in Social Security and then have everything, every penny that everybody makes, up to $10 billion a year, which is taxed for Social Security uh, FICA, and funding is solved. You don't have to change anything for Social Security. And definitely we don't want to re raise the retirement age because... Um, there are a lot of people who work in labor-intensive and very physically demanding fields that simply cannot afford to work until they're 70 years old before they qualify for retirement benefits. And furthermore, furthermore, um, there's no need for it. There's no need for it. Remove that cap. Now, I would even go further myself, and I would say that we need to demand more. We should have a much more generous Social Security program in this country. We should have a much more generous Medicare for All program in this country, which covers more things. Okay? And in addition to the Wall Street transaction tax, which would bring in a tremendous amount of money, okay, you also have the benefit of the Federal Reserve System. There's no political will to do this, of course, but it could be done. Now, in the same way that the Federal Reserve has given the banks basically free money, well, actually, it's not free money. Uh, it goes from virtually free loan to actually the Federal Reserve paying banks to take their money, is basically what it, uh, what it boils down to. 
So they give trillions of dollars in loans at a quarter of a percent interest, and then the banks leave that money in the Federal Reserve system, and the Federal Reserve pays them interest on that parked money. So basically it's not free. The Federal Reserve gives them a little bit of money um, to have that money on their books. There is absolutely nothing preventing the Federal Reserve from bailing out the states, bailing out municipal governments, and funding Medicare and Social Security. All it takes is a political will to do so. Uh, it would be very easy for the president to nationalize the Federal Reserve, or to dictate policy to them, and to tell them what to do, to take it over as a function of the Treasury Department. And of course, Obama's not going to do this because the only thing he cares about is Wall Street, and that includes his entire operating system in the administration. But there's absolutely nothing to prevent this from happening, uh, except the political will to do so. Um, and that is a mechanism that could simply work. It's, and, and when it comes to funding infrastructure, jobless programs like a new... Uh, Works Progress Administration that we that we could desperately use today for building the infrastructure in this country, for rebuilding highways and roads, rebuilding the gas supply lines, rebuilding electrical supply lines, building new power plants, building new hospitals, building everything that this country desperately needs in order to upgrade our our sagging, uh, you know, infrastructure which is old and decaying. It could all be funded through the Federal Reserve without anything other than a political will to make it happen. That's why I call for the nationalization of the Federal Reserve and for it to be directed to fund these programs, to put people to work. At the end of the day, I think that the government has a role to play in this. But people point to individuals and politics as a way of saying that this can't happen because this guy is this and this guy is that. And I agree with all of that. Politics and all the people who, who are in office are all shams. It's all a game and it's never going to accomplish the things that we want. But if you just take that out of the equation, okay? I say there's a role for government to play, especially when there's economic hardship in the country, okay? And if you can have, if the Federal Reserve can bail out banks, uh, by giving them trillion dollars, trillions of dollars in loans, okay, at virtually zero percent interest, there's absolutely nothing to prevent them from giving, you know, five hundred billion dollars to California or to your own local community to, you know, uh, do all the things that they need to do there: fix your stoplights, uh, repair your roads. Uh, you know, uh, do flood prevention programs, uh, hire more police, hire more teachers, all of that kind of stuff. There's nothing to prevent that. And that's a legitimate role for government to have whenever you have economic downturns, especially. But when it comes to certain things that are very important for the nation as a whole, like your, you know, the aging population, your retirement, so that you are uh, able to... Uh, afford the basic necessities of life and more when you finally do reach retirement after working your whole life. And when it comes to health care, these are things that are legitimate things for government to be involved in. And I'm not saying that the government should have anything to do with the private delivery system. Okay, when I say Medicare for all for life, I say we expand that program, we cover much more, okay, and we cover everybody from cradle to grave. And the government basically just pays the bills to the private delivery system. That is your own private doctor who's in private practice or a private hospital. Um, but if you have a private industry in this country which does not, cannot, or will not provide for the nation what is necessary for the good of the nation, that is the general welfare, then the government is legitimately justified in stepping in and providing those services. If you have a small town out in the middle of nowhere that suddenly grows in population and you don't have a, you don't have a hospital that can serve that, 
the government should build that hospital because it's necessary. It's necessary for the general welfare of those people and if private industry is not willing, able, or whatever to do it, then that is a legitimate role for government to step in. And I think that health and health care is a legitimate thing for government to be involved in only insofar as they make sure that everybody in the country is included. That the general welfare does mean the general welfare and that it includes everybody. And the reason why I would say that Medicare for All for Life is a good solution is because you have this single care payer mechanism through this. It eliminates the hundreds of billions of dollars a year in costs through overhead, administration, and all the other bullshit that private health insurance companies add to our health care costs as a nation every year. And it is run with the virtually 1% overhead that Medicare has had. And by expanding this program, you make quality of life better for seniors and everybody else in this country uh, by making health care available for everybody and to making it affordable and to eliminating the giant gap between our very good private health delivery system and the, the health care consumer. So these are legitimate things that the government can be involved in. Okay? And I think it should be involved in when it comes to economic downturns like we have today. Okay, so um, if there's, oh, one other thing. Okay, let's, let's, look at, uh, let's look at this whole ideology that you hear on a lot of these alternative media sites about uh, who's really running the show in the world. And some of these people claim it's the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. Well, it's not the fucking Jews, okay? And um, for people who want to deny the legitimacy of the Nazi influence in our government, you merely have to look at history, and it slaps you right in the face. It's a reality. It can't be denied. Okay? But when it comes to the Jews running everything, you, there's, this is simply, you know, um, anti-Jew sentiment on the part of these people. Now, I can say unequivocally that when you look at the super powerful people, the incredibly wealthy, the banks, the, the, the uh, financial powerhouses around the world, and the people who are actually calling the shots, who are in the think tanks, who, you know, uh, direct the government programs, who plan, you know, into the future, some of these people are Jews. And that makes them just as evil as all of the other people who occupy this very privileged class which, you know, decides the course of human civilization, decides who is going to be president, decides, you know, what kind of foreign policy is going to be pursued, what nations are going to be demonized, etc., etc., etc. Some of them are Jews, and those people are fucking evil. Just like all of the um, white Europeans all of the Asians, all of the Americans that also occupy those positions. All of them are incredibly evil. All of them are, uh, are only interested in their own political power, their own wealth, their own continued existence, and their own raping of everybody else in order to maintain their position as the leaders of the world behind the scenes. Some of them are Jewish. And those people are just as evil as all the rest. But to say that this is an entire Jewish thing is just fucking stupid. It's stupid. So get over it. Um, so I think I pretty much said all I wanted to say for this time around. Uh, if you stuck around for the whole thing, um, I thank you. Uh, I hope this gives you a lot more background into how I come to the decisions and beliefs that I have. And uh, as, you know, pillars of the beliefs that I have over certain of these issues that I've talked about from time to time. I want you to remember several things, just in, in closing here. Okay, the Isra Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I think I have given you some background on this. 
in order to show my position is basically anti-Israel because they represent an illegal uh, rogue nuclear nation. Uh, they will not define their borders. They operate and engage in terrorist activity. And they have continuously and systematically oppressed the Palestinians. So they are much more to blame than the Palestinians. Although there are certainly terrorist elements within the Palestinian uh, uh, areas, Gaza, etc., um, that I don't support in the least. Uh, but uh, for the most part, the Palestinian people, I would imagine, are just like the average Israeli citizen. They would like to just live in peace, <laughs> I'm sure. But if you went and talked to them, you know, the vast majority of regular, everyday Israelis would say, yes, I just want to live in peace with my neighbors. And probably most of them don't have a problem with each other. But there are elements within each of those organizations which are evil. But certainly Israel has proven itself to be no loyal friend of the United States, trying to attack and murder uh, U.S. Uh, seamen on the uh, liberty as I pointed out before, and certainly engaging in horrid terrorist acts uh, for their own political gains. Um, and certainly it could be said that Palestinians and Arabs have done this as well. Certainly the United States, other countries, you know, we cannot uh, afford to say that this is something that's simply limited there. Okay, but I hope that I've explained that a little bit. I hope that I've pointed out to you how you cannot deny that there is a very real prevalent and still existing Nazi fascist element that is still here today, still absolutely infiltrating our entire corporate structure in this country, our entire government in this country and other governments around the world. The entire Cold War was manufactured and stoked by an independent Nazi element operating within the governments of the United States and the USSR. And to say that this somehow doesn't have any validity today is just to deny the facts of history. Go look at it. Go actually open your eyes. Quit listening to the Jew haters, because usually the Jew haters are the ones that want to deny that Nazism and fascism and all of the ideology that they represent are still very strong, powerful elements in the world today in our own country and in other countries around the world and in, in the corporate culture itself. Usually those two go hand in hand. And the Jew haters are usually the ones that say the Jews are running everything behind the scenes. And people who say that are just, you're just stupid, okay? You're just stupid. If you go and look into it rather than listening to your Jew hater uh, people who talk about this stuff, if you just actually do some research, you'll see that it's not the Jews. Yes, Jews are involved. And those Jews who are involved are just as fucking evil as everybody else. Okay? And when it comes to uh, the left-right paradigm, there is no left anymore. 